Anybody else need? Okay. So you know that Rosh Hashanah, we're going to the booklet, I'll tell you which page we're going to do now. In the booklet, we're going to do page 40, page 40. So there's a few things here, but on page 40, at the top of the page, it says the words Yom Hadin. One of the things about Rosh Hashanah is it's a day of judgment. So first of all, it's very interesting to note the source of every yantam is in the Chumash, right? Pesach, Shavuos, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, that's what? Where in the Chumash does it say that Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment? The answer is nowhere. Well, it's you, even called the day of the that's not. It's a day of remembrance. It doesn't say day of judgment. Even though if you stop a person on the street and say, what's Rosh Hashanah all about? They'll say, oh, this is the day that Hashem judges the world. But in the Chumash, it doesn't say that it's a day of judgment. So where do we know this, that it's a day of judgment? Generally speaking, two places from the Torah. Mm -hmm. It is in the Torah, but we need the oral Torah to give us the explanation. So let's turn to page 41. This is one place. Fact, we had it very recently in Chitas. Pasuk Yud Beis. It says, it talks about the land of Israel, and it says it's a land that Hashem looks after this land all the time. His eyes are on the land always. Page 42. Mereshiz Hashanah Madach Rishonah. So this Pasuk I just read is in Chumish Devarim. Parshas Akev, it's chapter 11, and it's Pasuk 12. Hashem's eyes are on the land from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So let's look at Rashi. When it says the eyes of Hashem, look at page 41, the eyes of Hashem are always upon it. So Rashi says, in order, what does it mean his eyes are on the land? To see what are the needs. Then Rashi goes on to say, what does it mean for the beginning of the year to the end of the year? It really should have said Hashem's eyes are on the land all the time. If it's there from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, it means it's all the time. So why say from the beginning of the year to the end of the year? It just say it's there all the time, all the years, all the months, all the days. So Rashi says Hashem looks at the beginning of the year to initiate decrees concerning everything that's going to happen for the rest of the year. From the beginning of the year, we're being judged what will be at the end of the year. So this is the source in the written Torah 
that Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment. Because it says that Hashem sees things from the beginning of the year to the end, which means the first day of the year, he judges what the end of the year will be. That's one source. Another source is also in this booklet, but it's, let me tell you which page it's on. And the other source is from a Pasuk in Tehillim. And that is, let me find it. Page 40, is it 42? No, it's not 42. No, the other person I'm looking for, mistake. 42A? I don't have 42. What? Tehillim Pei Aleph, yeah. Oh, I guess there must be two editions of this also. <laughs> New ones and later ones. Oh, you're right. Everything is so complicated. 42A. So it's chapter Tehillim Pei Aleph. You might recognize it from the Siddur because we always say it every Thursday. And what does it say there? It says these words. Tiku b'achoy the shefer, lo the shefer, yem chagenu, for our holiday. Kichet the Yisrael hu, it's a day of judgment. Mishpat the Lekei Yaakov, it's a day of judgment that the God of Yaakov judges us. So the Gemara says, it says, Tiku blow the shaifa b'chaydish, b'kesa, the Yom Chagain. the word b'kesa in Hebrew means hidden, the chasot, means to cover up, to hide. When do we blow the shaifa that the moon is hidden? Chaydish is the moon. The moon is the, called chaydish, the month goes by the moon. When is do we blow shaifa when the moon is hidden? That's Rosh Hashanah. And what does it say about that day? It's a day of judgment where Hashem judges us and gives decrees for the next year. So this is another source that Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment. That's where we know it from. But let's go into understanding the difference between the way Hasidus understands the day of judgment and the way we understand the day of judgment without Hasidus. Generally speaking, day of judgment means just like a judge in a courtroom, there's an issue that needs to be verified. And what's supposed to be the ruling? And the judge gives a ruling that this and this is supposed to happen. So we think the same with Hashem. That in Rosh Hashanah, Hashem sort of declares what's going to happen this year. In Hasidus, it says, no, it's much deeper than that. What is it? So first, let's look at page 43. And this is a prayer which we have in the davening, and we have it a number of times. Every time we blow the shofar, we say these words, Hayoyim haras oilam. If you look in the English, it says, today is the birthday of the world. It was made, the word haras, is like the Hebrew word hirayom, which means when a woman conceives. So it's the beginning of creation. So it's like the birthday of the world. Yeah. Right. Right. So in other words, the world wasn't considered really a, a, a true significant existence until other Mauritian came into being. But this word also gives us a deeper understanding of what it means when we say that it's a day of judgment. And this is what it says in the Maimarim of Exodus. That on this day, Hashem doesn't only judge us what's going to happen the rest of the year, but actually whatever is meant to happen for the rest of the year actually happens on Rosh Hashanah. What does that mean? So there are a few statements in Gemara that seem to be contradicting or hard, or difficult to understand. Look, I'll get back to the original page, page 40. 
One line says like this, Adam Nidim B'chol Yayim. A person is judged every day. And the question is, if we're judged on Rosh Hashanah, why do we need to be judged every day? We already have, have had our judgment. There's another place that goes even further and says, Adam Nidim B'chol Shah. A person is judged every moment. If we're judged on Rosh Hashanah and we're judged every day, why do we need to be judged every moment? There's a famous Gemara that the Gemara says, this is Dava, this is the fourth thing on the list. Even if there is a sharp sword and the sharp sword is actually on your throat, a person should never give up to ask Hashem for mercy because we're judged every moment and it could be that moment your judgment will change. And there are people who actually had such experiences where they were a moment away from the opposite of life. I had a student in the school here many years ago. She was from Hungary. I think she was our first student from that country. And unfortunately, one of the horrible things that the Nazis did in Hungary was they lined up thousands of people by the river and they shot them, they should fall into the water. And that's how they didn't have to bother with them, just fell into the river. Unfortunately, killed thousands of people in there. Her grandmother was on that line. And her grandmother dived into the water, pretending as if she was shot, but she was really alive. And she tried to swim underground as far as she can. And it started to rain, so everyone ran back in with the Nazis, and she swam very far away, and she survived. And this is our granddaughter came to our school. Yeah. And uh, a woman like that, you can say the sword was at her throat. I mean, they were shooting people, and they shot at, at where she was standing. Somehow, they didn't, the bullet didn't get her, but she, uh, her life was saved the last minute, which means apparently there was a judgment that this is supposed to happen to her, and the last minute, the judgment was turned around. So people are being judged all the time. Why do we need this judgment on Rosh Hashanah? And it's obviously also apparent from the fact that we daven every day. If we're judged on Rosh Hashanah and everything is fixed and decreed, then what's the point in davening every day? Hashem do this, Hashem do that. It's already decreed. So the answer is we can be judged again every day and things could change. So why is it so... So such an amazing thing. No, Rosh Hashanah is, that's going to set the tone for the whole year. How does it work? Here on, uh, on, on, this, on this line, at number test, it says, Kom is a nice of shaladam, which means all the sustenance of a person is already designated between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So what does all this mean? This is the way Hasidus explains it. And because you have knowledge from Hasidus from other places, you'll be able to understand it. And that is, and this is what it means that today the world conceives. When a baby is born and the baby is fully developed, hands and feet and eyes and mouth and every single organ, Baruch Hashem, a healthy baby, but the baby's existence didn't start this moment. The baby's existence started nine months earlier when they were conceived. Well, the same if a tree grows out of the ground. And here you see the trees or plants sprouting from the ground. They're sprouting now, but it didn't begin now. It actually began months earlier when the seeds were planted. This is a human seed. This is a seed of plants and trees. The same as the Rosh Hashanah. First of all, we have to preface that everything that happens in this world, every child that's born, every weather that takes place, whether it's raining, whether it's snowing, whether it's windy, whether it's sunny, everything that happens, whether there's war, whether there's other things happening, everything that happens down here has to first happen up there. And from up there, it manifests and comes down here. That's what it means that everything in the physical realm is derived from the spiritual realm. To think of it uh, just of something we could relate to, it says that Hashem is invested in, in the world like the Nisham is invested in the body. So we have a Nisham and a Guf. 
every movement that a person makes with his body is really a result of some movement going on internally. A person's running, if he's walking, if he's smiling, if he's crying, if he's talking, basically something's going on internally in his mind and his heart and his feelings. And it manifests either he's screaming or he's shouting or he's crying or he's running. So the body is an expression of and a manifestation of what he's experiencing internally. And therefore, we can use it as a mushroom. Whatever happens here on earth, cars are running, trains are flying, planes are flying, everything, there's something going on up there. And from up there, it comes down here and it takes place down here. So if Hashem, for example, decreed on Rosh Hashanah that this person, so-and-so, is going to have a child for the first time this year. And the child will be born, let's say, in the month of Tammuz. So the simple way of explaining it is that on Rosh Hashanah, Hashem decreed, He decided and chose that this is going to happen so many months later. According to Hasidus and Kabbalah, it's more than that. The godly energy that Hashem manifests of himself that's going to be the source and give life to this child, that godly energy is revealed and, and released, so to speak, on Rosh Hashanah. I'll get to you in a second. And then from Rosh Hashanah, it evolves and evolves and evolves from one world to a lower world to a lower world. And eventually, on that day that was designated, that light of Hashem, that energy of Hashem, it becomes the child, and then the child is born. Or the, the same with any bracha that happens to a person throughout the year. Yes, Nadia. The child is born on Rosh Hashanah, was that a creep in the previous year, or was that a really fast accident? Yeah, no, it was a creep in the previous okay. year, yeah. Because a child that's born on Rosh Hashanah, it was already conceived months before, so it all began before. Okay. Right. Well, but the child could have been born earlier later. Right. That fact that the date for the child to be born, that's already declared on Rosh Hashanah. So that means that everything that's going to happen for the next, I mean, it, it's, it's overwhelming for a human mind to even think like this because it's impossible. Hashem is infinite. But it means that every single thing that is going to happen in the future of the year, the next 354 days or whatever amount of days there are, whatever is going to happen, the spiritual seed that's responsible for it is all begins to be sort of re released from Hashem on Rosh Hashanah. And that is not only for me, but for every person in the world, every man, every woman, every Jew, every non-Jew, every uh, vegetable, plants, animals, everything in the world, whatever happens begins on Rosh Hashanah up there, and from there it evolves down here. So what's happening from Rosh Hashanah until let's say 10 months later when it actually happens? The answer is, I just finished telling you, it goes through a process of evolving. Like what happens when you plant a seed until the tree grows? It's actually processing, there's something going on. A baby in the mother's womb is being processed. The, the, the process takes nine months. For a tree, it takes more time, less time. But all the time, it's that nothing's happening, it's being processed. Spiritually, if Hashem decides on Rosh Hashanah that in 10 months from now, this is going to happen, and 11 months, that's going to happen, and in 12 months, uh, this is going to happen, or eight months and three days, the other thing is going to happen, it means it's, it begins on Rosh Hashanah, the light from Hashem is revealed on Rosh Hashanah, and then it takes eight months and three days for it to be processed. Yep. So that sounds like this idea is like a talking about like a plant that is seeing and then like throughout the year, it like develops and that's more like Bima. So then why is it mom like? Is it like it's, it's a, you gave a good analogy. I'm soon learn something in Tanya which actually uses that those terms. And then we'll answer the question about the mother. Yeah. Um, if all of the, I forget the exact word that you, you, that you used, but you're talking about how the spiritual energy is like released on this day. Yeah. So is that the whole idea of like making a keli for a bracha? Like the potential is already there and you need to do your part to like draw it down? That's and what also, we're coming to, right. Could Let, you do something to like, um, Exodate the process. That's, that's what we're coming to. Where is the where are the markers here? 
So what I'm saying is, let's say a person, Hashem, decreed on Rosh Hashanah that this person is going to buy a car. It's a car. It's a modern car. So what happens is a certain light of Hashem, a chesed of Hashem, specific, is revealed up, in, up there, and then it evolves from here, 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 here. And eventually, what happens to that light, it evolves into a car. If you win the lottery on a certain day, you bought the right ticket, Hashem led you to it, that means that this light of Hashem was the light and the energy that gave you and led you to buy that ticket. And then the money comes to you. But it began on Rosh Hashanah, and the actual day that you get the drawing and you get the money, that is how much time it took to be processed from here to here. Oh, so now I'm going to explain how it works according to Hasidus. So Hasidus explains the following. So imagine a person had a bracha that they're going to have a car, they're going to buy a house, they're going to have a child, they're going to have a, win a lot of uh, $5 million. And chas v'shalom, a person does something that is wrong and it blocks the bracha. So the bracha begins to evolve from here to here to here to here to here to here. And then somewhere along the line, when I did what I did, I'm sort of, I block it. It doesn't, it doesn't continue in its path. I stopped it. It's not totally destroyed, but it's frozen in right in the spot. How does it get frozen? Because I did something which blocks it oh. coming down. Yeah. No, when it comes to doing right and wrong, that's free choice. So the free of that. And and then let's say I do chuba something, the block is removed. And then it continues and I get the bracha. So basically, even though the bracha was given on Rosh Hashanah, but every day, let's say today I'm supposed to get certain brachas, I daven every day because the bracha came down, down, down. But now I want the bracha to manifest in the physical realm. So I'm judged again, should it continue or should it be stopped? So there is another judgment, but it's not about the initial bracha. It's whether the bracha should continue. And to give an example, there's a, a famous story in Gemara that I think everybody knows. The Gemara tells a story about a stargazer that he told his students, you see this girl who's a Kaaba and she's getting married tonight. I see in the stars that this is going to be the last day of her life. And, then, and who was she? The daughter of Rabbi Kiva. And the Gemara says the next day she was alive and well. So the student said to him, hey, you missed it. Said, no, no, it can be something went wrong. And he went to her and said, tell me, can, give me permission, could I search your house? And he told her why he wants to do it. So she gave him permission. He searched the house and he found that at night before she went to sleep, she had a hat with a pin. She stuck the pin into the wall. And she didn't realize that when she did that, she stuck it into the eyes of a deadly snake and she killed the snake. So he told the students, you see, there was a poisonous snake. Something was meant to happen, but apparently the last minute it was stopped. When she told her father of Akiva what happened, the Akiva said to her, tell me, what did you do at the night of your wedding? Something exceptional, extraordinary. And the only thing she could think of was she said that every wedding, we usually try to make a table for the poor people. Everybody's at a wedding and they're rejoicing. And these people are so poor, so they should also be happy. We make a table for them. But she noticed that nobody was taking care of them. So she, the Kala herself, 
went and got them food and took care of these poor people. So he said, in that merit, your life was saved. The whole Gemara talks about the power of tzedakah. What does it mean? It means there was a decree on Rosh Hashanah. We don't know why. Not only there was a decree, but the decree on Rosh Hashanah started to manifest in this physical world. It was already a snake and it was approaching her. It was already in her house. But the last minute, because she did a mitzvah, whatever negative thing was meant to happen was stopped and, and it didn't happen. So basically, this is why we dive in every day for both. If chas was shown there was anything to create on Russia and in the negative, I'm davening that it should be stopped. Even though it was already decreed and it's already being processed, I can still daven to stop it. And on the other hand, there could be positive things that were decreed, but maybe they won't be delivered to my doorstep because something's gonna block it. So I'm davening to Hashem to remove all the blockages and it should actually be delivered to me in the most physical sense, yeah. So in Shabbos every day, the four brachas um, of Rosh Hashanah and Shabbos Shabbos, right? So we have Rosh Hashanah, this whole world. Is that like, if a bracha is like has a blockage and like one of the worlds, like by saying that tefillah in the morning, you could like unstick it? Which one? It's probably connected to that somehow. The davening has four parts and each part corresponds to one of the four worlds. There's a story of the Rebbe Rashab. The Rebbe repeated the story more than once. That a chassid once came to him. Apparently, somebody was very sick, and it looked like the situation was hopeless. And the Rebbe Rashab said to him, "I'm sorry, I can't help you." He walked out, and he just broke down crying. He couldn't move. He stood by the Rebbe's door, and just crying and crying and crying. Rebbe Rashab had an older brother. And the older brother saw him crying and he walked over, tried to calm him down. He asked him what happened. And he told him. So he said, Wait here. He walked into the room. His older brother said to Rebbe Rashab, How could you not help him? A yid is in such a distress, in such a situation. You have to help him. He's outside there crying. So the Rebbe Rashab said, Okay, tell him to come in again. Came in a second time, he gave him a bracha. The bracha was fulfilled and everything went well. Whenever the Rebbe told the story, the Rebbe himself would be, would usually choke up every time I heard the Rebbe tell the story. And the Rebbe asked, what happened here? If the Rebbe could give him the bracha, was capable, he would have done it the first time. If he didn't, obviously he wasn't capable. So just because his brother walked in and said, how could you not help him? What, what difference did it make if he can't? So this was the Rebbe's answer. The Rebbe Rashab saw that this person has a bracha already, but there was something blocking. When he went out of the Rebbe's room and he broke down crying, by doing that, he broke whatever was there that was blocking. And as a result of that, he was now a vessel to receive the bracha. So he came back in and he gave him the bracha and it was able to work. I don't remember 100%, if the Rebbe even said that this was the Rebbe's intention in the first place, why he told him such harsh words, I can't help you. He wanted him to take it to heart. As a result of that, he'll be able to break through whatever barrier there was. So this is what it means that there are times that there's a bracha just sitting and waiting for us and we have to make the cave. There's a, a famous story along the same lines it was once a Hasidic Rebbe, but whenever he traveled and he would travel to a certain town, he always stayed in the home of a very specific Hasid. Apparently he had good accommodations, and was very comfortable, he always stayed in his house. One time he came and uh, instead of staying in his house, he went to someone else's house. He was shocked. He went to the Rebbe's secretaries and he said, there must be some mistake. You took the Rebbe to the wrong house. He always stays in my house. So he said, no, the Rebbe specifically told us not to go to your house, but to go to the other person's house. Really? Do you know why? No idea. Okay, can I come speak to the Rebbe? No. What do you mean, no? Why can't I speak to the Rebbe? He always sees people. Yeah, but he gave us explicit instructions that he shouldn't be allowed to come speak to him. 
Now he was really beside himself. Like he could, what did I do wrong? Something must have happened that I'm getting this kind of treatment. And as much as he sort of was breaking his head, he couldn't figure out what happened, what did he do since the last time that the Rebbe is treating him this way. Eventually he got a message from the Rebbe, what the Rebbe's message was, I don't, I will not allow you to come until you bring 2,000 rubles, which is an enormous sum of money. And he didn't know what to do with himself. He'd sell his house and his cow and his chicken and whatever he had, he'll still have to work who knows how many overtime hours for who knows how long to get this kind of money together. That day, um, there were a group of soldiers that came to town and the rule in Russia was, that when soldiers come to town, you have to open your home and give them a place to sleep, which he did, they had no choice. In the middle of the night, they heard a, a call, a bugle call, and um, apparently there was a runoff to fight somewhere. So they all ran out and they all went to wherever they were called for. And then he found, after they all left, he found that in the room where they were, there was a, a bag there. He opened up the bag and there were tens of thousands of gold coins, worth much more than 2,000. He went to the road. I'm not sure what the circumstances was, but I guess in those days, you're going out to war, whatever the road said that he's allowed to take this money because these people will never come back again. They're out there. And of course, he wasn't interested in wealth. What he was, he brought, he took 2,000 ruble and he came running to the Rebbe. Okay, now you have to let me in. He expected to see a very stern face and the Rebbe should be very upset with him. Instead, the Rebbe is smiling, very warm, very pleasant. And, he, and finally he breaks down, Rebbe, what did I do? Why did I deserve this? And the Rebbe said, actually, you did nothing. <laughs> what happened was I saw that in heaven it was decreed that you have to become very wealthy. But in order for that to happen, any bracha that comes has to come through prayer. And I knew that you'll never daven for wealth. You'll daven to have money to live, for health, for nachas from your children, but you're not gonna daven for wealth. It's just, you're not into wealth. I had to find a way to get you to daven for wealth. Once you daven for wealth, the bracha came crashing down. And there you got it. And that's the way Hashem gave it to you. Which Rebbe was it? It wasn't one of the Rebbe's of Chabad. Oh, okay. So, so there could be like a Bracha that's coming down, like at the Kervin, somewhere in prayer, you can bring it down before you do. Like, does it, like, it does it bad decree also get further? Like, with the Rabbi King's yeah. daughter, like, was the snake thing, like, after she stopped it with the pin, like, it was still there, the decree? And it just seems like she should. There's probably two down possibilities. Down. One possibility, it maybe depends on what caused it to be stopped, what kind of mitzvah it was, that was it tshuva, was it a mitzvah, was it tzedakah? In that case, it was tzedakah. Could be some things freeze it, but it's still there, and some things nullify it completely. In fact, one of the reasons why it says to be extremely careful not to, God forbid, pronounce the opposite of a bracha to another person is because, and the same with a bracha, why is it that it says anybody's bracha could really help? I'm not a tzaddik, how can my bracha help? The answer is because very often the person already has the bracha, but because of some reason the bracha was sort of frozen. When I pronounce the bracha, I'm not doing that much. All I'm doing is I'm reactivating that bracha that's already there, that it should break through the barrier and come down. But it could also be done in the opposite. So God forbid a person says, and curses someone, this and this should happen, they can be doing the same thing. Maybe there's already some sort of negative energy. And by you saying that verbally, you're, react, you're activating that negative energy. So we're told, according to the Torah, not to bring out of our mouths anything which is the opposite of Baruch. Yeah. So if someone got paid with that, and the, the negative thing fell down on the other person, would the person who kind of like spoke it Right, but only Hashem himself knows no. what's happening. Right. We don't know. Right. We don't understand these things. Because we don't know. But we do know that pronouncing the opposite of the blessing is against Torah. Right. Yeah. So we know Dr. Um, Benjamin. Um Benjamin was thinking. So 
was verbally like is even stronger. Right. So if what about the opposite? Like the Yitzhahara can just like put random thoughts in your head and you're like, whoa, I don't want to be thinking that. So but what if those thoughts are like you're saying the opposite of Raphael said the opposite of things? Is thinking them just as I guess it's not just as bad as we shouldn't be thinking negative thoughts either. It's not as powerful as words. But when a person sees that there are thoughts coming, which very often something goes wrong, let's say you don't feel we go to a doctor, I wonder what he's gonna say. Some people, you know. They have a little boo boo on their finger. They're already thinking, oh, who knows right. what's going to happen? Um, what we can only do is the fact that the thoughts come to me is we're human, so it comes. But, it's like dwelling, on but it. dwelling on it and just try to just knock it out of my head and not focus on it. Some people go, like, oh, if this does happen, then I'll do this and I'll go there and I'll speak to that person. Nothing happened yet. Yeah. You go to the doctor and he says, just blow your nose more often, you'll be fine. You know? <laughs> and he's already imagining who knows what's happening. Right, you know? right. So this is also the reason why it says in Shulchan Aruch, and the Rebbe encourages tremendously. In fact, one year the Rebbe said, everybody should make a point, whoever they meet and they see, give them a bracha to have a v'chasima tova. You know, there's a song that they sing with the words ksiva v'chasima tova. That's when they compose that song. Because the Rebbe said, everybody should just make a point when you see someone, just say, which means that we have the power to sort of, uh, by verbalizing it, to bring down the bracha to the other person. And this explains another thing. One of the customs of Rosh Hashanah is to dip the apple into honey. And also to eat a sweet apple. Why? She have a sweet year. It's very nice, but on the surface, what do I need to eat a sweet apple? I could daven to have a sweet year. I have to dip the sweet apple in honey. And there are many customs. Some people take other foods and they, they make it with honey or different sweet kind of foods. What does that have to do with food? I mean, uh, it's part of my davening. So the way Hasidus explains it is that when we take the an apple that's sweet and I eat it, or I take challah and I dip it in the honey, which is sweet. What we're doing is we're making an effort to connect the bracha of Hashem's chesed, whatever bracha is up there. It's like an anchor. We're connecting it to the physical world. It should ultimately descend to the physical. It should manifest in a physical, concrete way that we should feel it and see it on our level. It shouldn't remain somewhere in Atzilas, Brio, Yetzirah, which should come down here. And that's why we say the words, the Shana Teva Masukha and Ksiva Chasim Teva. And we do all these things because it's not enough to get the bracha on Rosh Hashanah. We want more than that. We want to make sure that the bracha manifests and descends back down to the most physical, tangible, concrete level, which is down here in this world. Yeah. So, when we learn that it's like, like um, health. Right, like mental, emotional, physical health. So, and we're like internalizing it because we're actually eating and digesting hunger. So, does this have like a similar idea that the the literal apple that we're dipping into the honey, like we're internalizing the sweetness? Yes, yes. Of course, the sweetness in a physical apple also comes from Hashem's chesed, but it's sweetness in a physical way. So, by do, eating it physically and doing it in a physical way, it draws down the bracha down to the physical level. The only thing is, you might ask a question, wait a second, if that's the case, then why do we make such a commotion at Rosh Hashanah anyway, have to continue davening throughout the year? So the answer is, it's much easier to prevent something from being started than once it's started, to stop it. In other words, if I don't plant a seed, it's not gonna grow. But if I plant the seed and something grows, I have to uproot it. That's a much more complicated thing. And of course, in a woman conceives and she really didn't want this child or whatever. That's a whole different story. You can say, oh, there's abortion. It's not so simple. It's very complicated. And you don't want that. So if you don't want something, just to begin with, don't let it take root. So basically, Rosh Hashanah is the day that everything takes root. And on that day, through davening and all the tzedakah we do and preparation and elul, 
We prevent negative things from taking root and we bring positive things to take root. And once that happens, then it's so much easier for things to continue in that time. So yes, we can dabble, we can do tshuva, we can give tzedakah and change things. But generally speaking, it's more difficult. That's why there's more of a focus on Rosh Hashanah itself doing the right thing. That's the beginning. There is one chapter in Tanya. It's not in the first part of Tanya. It's actually in the third, in the fourth part of Tanya, which is called Igerita Kodesh. That specifically explains uh, what I just said. It's a little bit different there, but because it's so important, I put it in the booklet and we'll, we'll learn. It's a short, but it's the source for this idea that we're talking about. So you have it in the booklet here. And it's the first page after page 40, 40, after page 40. We don't have the time to do the whole thing, but we'll start. He gave us a Kodesh, a letter that the author of the sent. And most of the letters were sent in reference to Tzedakah. And tzedakah wasn't just ordinary tzedakah, mainly it was tzedakah for people living in Eretz Yisrael. I mean, there's a history behind this. I'll just give the brief history. The brief history is that the opposition against Hasidus was very, very severe. Uh, people were being persecuted. People were being harassed. Businesses were being undermined. Families were being... Uh, you know, people ended up informing against them, false accusations, ending up in jail, it became very, very difficult. And a few rabbis, three rabbis, one was a man of Arda, and two others, they decided that they and many families are going to leave Europe and they're going to go to Israel. And they did that. And the Alter Rebbe was part of the group. He also left. On the way, in the middle of the journey, al Rebbe had a lot of discussions with Rabbi Mendel of Haradak. He was like the senior student of the Magid. And to some extent, the al Rebbe accepted him almost like a Rebbe after the Magid was nostalgic, after the Magid passed, to, the, to consult with him, should he stay or go back? And apparently, he must have encouraged him to, to, to stay, uh, to go like, back. What? So was he like his Mishpia? Yeah, like a Mishpia. And the Alter Rebbe went back and he decided he's going to go back and he's going to stand up against all the opposition and he's going to make, he became the sort of the head person to head all the activity of spreading Hasidus. And that's why he was arrested. That's why all the arrows were at him because he was the one who was mainly involved more than other Hasidic Rebbes in spreading Hasidus. But even though the Alter Rebbe didn't go, he took it upon himself that he's going to send money from here to the Jews who are living in Israel to help support them. And he established a fund, and that fund is called Kodal Chabad, the Meir Balanes. That's the fund that every Lubavitcher Chassid has in their home a pushka, and every woman makes a point to give tzedakah to that fund before candle lighting. Really? It's from the times of the Alter Rebbe. Yep. Is it over? What? It's single also. Yeah. So tomorrow you'll have. I don't have extras. But first of all, you can do something like this take a cup, write on it, Kola Chabad. And it becomes a Kola Chabad push. So you have two pushkas. This, this is a pushka that ever writes to people to give 18 cents before you light candles specifically. Shabbos, Yantif. Across the street, there's an office, which is the office of Kabbalah Chabad. You walk in there, you ask them for a pushka, they'll give it to you. I think it's 808 Eastern Parkway. It's like four houses, four doors from where. Guys, we're taking an excursion after school. Getting yeah, they won't have so many pushkas. Specifically, to give like when 
you get to talk about more than one for that before um friendship. It's specifically in the Pushka Kalaka water could be just be, for example, if you have a pushka on the wall of your kitchen, like could you just put it in there and you can yeah, you can do other things also, but then in addition to whatever I do. Specifically, call a chabad before okay. candle lighting. Okay. Before yeah. candle lighting. Yeah. Also, like the Shabbos, you said, it's much easier, like for dominating and understand, it's much easier to provide a negative decree to the Jews than like to try to change it later. But, like, also, like, what about like the flip side, like a positive thing? Like, sure. If you didn't make it like come into conception on Rosh Hashanah, like, is it possible something you do during the year, like, Oh, thank you for bringing it up. So Sarah's asking the question, what if I didn't do whatever I needed to do on Rosh Hashanah, before Rosh Hashanah? As a result of that, this bracha that I'm looking for never took roots on Rosh Hashanah. Is it something that I can do during the year that can even change that? No? Yes. The answer is yes. Those are the way out. In fact, this is the difference between asking for a bracha or asking for someone to pray to you. A bracha means to draw something down, which means when the rabbi gives a bracha, it usually means whatever we're talking about is already there, because everyone gets a lot of brachas on Rosh Hashanah, and the purpose of a bracha is to draw down something which is already in existence in a spiritual realm. Tefillah, when the Rebbe say, says, I'll daven for you, that's more than bracha. And the same with all of us. When, when we daven, we say the words, Yihi, Ratzon, Lufanecha, let it be your will. It's like saying, let there be a new will that wasn't there before, that I should get this and this. So through tefillah, proper tefillah, we can also have that even things that weren't designated in Rosh Hashanah for the good should happen. So most of the letters in this fourth volume of Tanya is about giving tzedakah for Eretz Yisrael. It's about what's so unique and special about tzedakah in general, and even more so, what's so special about giving tzedakah for the poor that live in Eretz Yisrael. There's something more about that than anything else. That's what, the, that's what it's about. And this chapter 14, this letter number 14, is about that. So again, this was a condition. The Alter Rebbe said, I'm going to go back to Russia and continue spreading Hasidus. And even though I didn't actually go to Israel, I will take upon myself to support those that did go. And the Alter Rebbe had certain Hasidim designated, and their mission was to go travel around to different people, and they would collect funds for Eretz Yisrael. So it looks like, if you look at the introduction, introduction is the part written right before the Hebrew, it appears that initially when all this started, everybody was excited about giving money for this tzedakah. And then as time went on, like many things, things start fading away, things start cooling off. And that letter, the, 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 the words in the, Rebbe, in the Alter Rebbe's letter is about, let's renew that enthusiasm, that excitement that you had initially to get that back again. Now, Sorry. yeah. Is this the point? Was this that time where, like, the Alta was trying to travel somewhere into the storm? Is this my getting the mix up? Yeah, what you're mixing it up is with the Balshemta. Oh. He tried to travel to Eretz oh. Yisrael, and there was a storm. The Alta Rebbe, he just was was going back and forth if he should or he shouldn't, and then, and then he decided to go back. The only Rebbe that went to Eretz Yisrael was Peter. Right. Really, only one was Right. Why him specifically? It's it's, it's, Did it's he actually. What do you mean in the building? I'm saying he was like a hotel. hotel. Oh, and he was in a hotel. Yeah, really? Oh, that's nice. He had like a he had a room and a balcony. It's, it's interesting, the problem. girls' yeshivas both have the same privilege. It's interesting. Yeah. I guess they're really By the way, 
See that building next the second building? The Rebbe was in that building also. Really? Yeah. Why is that? I just discovered it recently, like two or three years ago. Chabad Girls Academy? That building. It's part of our building here, but yes. He wasn't on this half. And that half. That half used to be Beis Rifka years ago. And talking about the 1950s. And on Yanta, because the Rebbe went to visit the Bochum's Seder, they tried to make it somewhere close. The Rebbe shouldn't have to walk far. So they had the Seder in that building. So the Rebbe came to that building to give them a bracha for the Seder. So that means our school building and our dorm building both had the Rebbe visiting. Okay, I think we'll stop here. Oh, to be continued. Thank you, Rabbi. You're very welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Really, really. Yeah. I've heard people say.